first of all, um, one of there are what are called uh, biochemical differences in individuality, uh, and never more so than in the matter of drugs. Uh, people are very different from each other. Years ago, I took a course from Sasha Shulgin um, at Cal, and uh, at one point he brought in some substance, I don't know what it was, and this was a class of 600 people, and passed it around and asked everybody to take a sniff of this bottle. Well, 598 people pronounced this stuff completely odorless. Two people were almost violently ill from the overpowering odor of this thing. They possessed a gene for the sensitivity to this compound that caused it to be for them overwhelming, for everyone else unnoticeable. And we're surrounded by these kinds of individual biochemical differences. In traditional societies, shamanism is often a family business, and it may well be that this is because ability to handle these psychedelic substances uh, and to really get mileage out of them is a genetic endowment of some sort. I mean, cannabis, again, it provides an interesting example. One of the commonest things you hear people say about cannabis who don't smoke it is they say, I, I used to where I tried it, but it makes me paranoid. Uh, well, uh, if, to the people who use it, this is inconceivable. In fact, it's almost an antidote to paranoia. Uh, because it seems to make things appear more Taoistic, more integrated, it all makes more sense. These are biochemical differences that need to be studied. You know, different racial groups have different relationships to intoxication. I mean, I think it's probably there is some truth to the idea that the North American Indians had a susceptibility to distilled alcohol that the Europeans, who had been dealing with it for a couple of centuries by the time they arrived here, didn't have, because the North American Indians represented a, uh, a closed gene pool, never having been exposed to this. There was no selection for being able to handle it. Uh, and then there's another issue in relation to your question, John, which is, first of all, you know, some people say, well, not all shamans take hallucinogens. Well, true, and I've excited some people's ire by suggesting, but all real shamans <laughs> do. And, uh, you know, saying that somebody is a shaman, I mean, imagine if simply being able to rave and exhort on the subject of the four Gospels qualified you as a man of the Lord. Uh, actually, you have to sort through dozens of so-called preachers to find somebody you would be willing to leave alone with your chickens. Well, similarly, uh, you have to sort through a lot of uh, people who claim to be shamans before you find somebody who really is one. I mean, if we tend to be naive. Go to the Amazon with your heart on your sleeve seeking ayahuasca, and I guarantee, unless you go well-connected, you'll drink a lot of swill before you get to somebody honest enough, responsible enough, conscientious enough to actually make it right and do it right. And in, in the case of shamanism, usually this is going on in <coughs> cultures without literacy, without written languages, and, and so they don't hold conferences or publish proceedings or have the university uh, matriculation examinations in shamanism so on the surface a shaman is anyone who claims to be a shaman 
or who cares to claim, but I, in terms of uh, real shamanic ability, I think it only comes through either innate special abilities, which probably means innate high sensitivity to neurological, um, to neurotransmitters, exotic neurotransmitters, or it comes through an exposure to hallucinogens. Uh, this is a big argument in anthropology. Merci Eliade, who normally I am very deferent to, got this one completely wrong and decided on absolutely no evidence that what he called narcotic shamanism was decadent. Well, first of all, the use of the word narcotic in that context shows that he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Nobody uses narcotics to shamanize. You go to sleep if you take narcotics. So what he wanted to say was that he felt hallucinogenic shamanism was decadent. But what is the alternative? Reliance on ordeals, fasting, or pathological personalities. Maybe epileptics or... Uh, borderline schizophrenics or something like that. I think the, that these kinds of shamanisms that are not hallucinogenically based are derivative shamanisms that occur at a later stage of culture when the, the uh, plant-based shamanism has been disrupted by some, some uh, factor like migration or the disappearance of the plants involved or something like that. Yeah. From what I understand, uh, the Lakota Indians did use hallucinogenics. They uh, accomplished all of this through, you know, uh, the drum beat and the song and things like that. And to this day, if you talk to the Lakota about the use of hallucinogenics as far as their shamans go, they say, it's not necessary. And yet in the Southwest, in the Southwest, you know, it's common. Yeah, well, I think acoustical uh, acoustical driving can carry you a certain distance. There are substitutes for hallucinogens, but they're neither as effective nor as... Uh, pleasant. I mean, ordeals are what many cultures get into. Well, I was just thinking, you know, along the lines of, you know, someone like Crazy Horse who came out of the Lakota seemed to possess these, you know, abilities uh, and manifest them physically. Well, there's also the exceptional personality. The exceptional personality breaks all the rules, see. But, um, something I wanted to say. So would you say, would you say then, um, Terrence, that there is a genetic proclivity, maybe in some individuals, if there is access to um, botanicals, and if the, there is no uh, historical evidence of shamanism prior to that, for that individual to start engaging in explorations? Yeah, I think so. You know, Maria Sabina claimed that she was never initiated into shamanism. She claimed that as a girl herding the cattle, she ate the mushrooms because she was hungry. And that she was basically self-taught in shamanism in a society that actually had shamanic uh, lineages and institutions. Uh, in Madagascar, there are these highly evolved uh, ordeal poisons, and this is where you take a you take a plant. If you feel like you're dying, you beg to die, you want to die, and you don't die. You come back from it a better person, but it is only because you were slammed up against death itself. Ordeals work but they're not very pleasant. And the idea of putting yourself through an ideal like that once a week or twice a month as part of your professional practice is, is, uh, is pretty outrageous. 
the other thing that has to be said, and this is really important, and I think anthropologists have sold this one short, experiences are what we are least able to communicate to each other. We can describe machine parts, agricultural procedures, but anything in the realm of feeling, our languages are woefully impoverished. And I don't think that's specific to English. I think it, it haunts all human experience, that it's hard to communicate how we feel. Well, so then there's a vast spectrum of experiences that come from plants. Uh, and I dare say most of them unpleasant. Uh, let's start out with uh, eating Diefenbachia or something, you know, which causes your throat tissues to swell up and you feel like you're strangling. Or, uh, uh, you know, Amanita muscaria is a very controversial a shamanic plant because some people say it's garbage and Gordon Wasson in his last book called it the supreme entheogen of all time well uh, clearly people are are they talking about different things or are they interpreting the same experience differently uh, and so there are uh, for example you know people who are fond of peyote like if they haven't done their homework like to imagine that they are taking this ancient, ancient hallucinogen that has informed the lives of the of the Sonoran and and uh, the Indians of that area for thousands and thousands of years. Well, this is, as far as anybody can tell, complete bunk. Uh, there is no record of peyote use. Uh, older than four or five hundred years. Most of it is post-ghost dance. Before, if, when you go into the old Sonoran graves, the old archaeology of the Sonoran, the Tarahumara Indians, you find Sikora Secunda, uh, yeah, Secora beans, the little uh, black and red beans that you see in Mexico strung into jewelry sold along the side of the roads. That's what those Indians took for thousands and thousands of years. We have a continuous record over about 4,000 years of these seeds being buried in graves with uh, ritual instruments indicating that they were buried with shamans. You couldn't give it away today because it is such a horrible experience. It's essentially sub sublethal strychnine it poisoning. You. It can kill you effortlessly. It's clear that at some point fairly recently, somebody tried peyote and said, my God, this stuff we've been taking for thousands and thousands of years is just horrible compared to this. This is great. <laughs> And immediately there was a transfer of loyalty. And Lord knows, eating fresh peyote is no gourmet. Other than <laughs> so the point there being, cultures tend to um, define experiences differently. And you can't tell what people are talking about until you really check in. Uh, traveling around the world, you know, you all you end up in certain cultures and they say, oh, we're so happy to have you here. Um, as our honored guest, we would like you to eat uh, some of our national food. Let's say you're in Scotland. And so they say, well, you must eat some haggis because uh, this is what we all eat. We all really love this. This is the best part of Scottish life. Mm -mm. Boy, are you going to love this. Well, when it's finally served, you know, your jaw drops in disbelief uh, because it's ghastly unless you're Scotch. And... Uh, well, but if you're Scotch, you dare not say so, you see, because a cultural myth has been built up around, I mean, do Italians knock red wine? Do the French denounce truffles? Uh, certainly not. Uh, 
<laughs> ah, true. <laughs> Pate de foie gras is always my uh, example. Of this. So what you have to realize is that these things are culturally defined and often what works for the Nyanamamo or the Muinani or the Witoto won't work for you. Datura is a good example. Datura is a shamanic plant used by many people throughout uh, the world. All of them, I think, pharmacologically deprived. Otherwise, they wouldn't put up with what you have to put up with to take that stuff, you know. And uh, my interest, and I you know it was practical, was to find a hallucinogen that did what I wanted it to do and didn't do anything I didn't want it to do. And what I was interested in was, first of all, hallucinations, because... Some people say I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> Fine. My notion is that if you can see something that isn't there, that's very much more convincing than just funny thoughts, racing ideas, strange physical sensations. It's a powerful and boundary-dissolving confrontation when you confront what is not there. And so I find, and this is a heresy for sure, I, I'm not that fond of LSDs. I think it's a very sloppy drug. I, I think, you know, you feel terrible the next day. I always did. I had tight headaches, body aches. People always say, well, it was not clean. It had speed in it. It had strychnine in it. Mm, maybe. But even the good stuff, is not, uh, and it wouldn't hallucinate for me the way I wanted it to. I could get hallucinations if I would smoke hash with it, but on its own, it was what I have described in other places as abrasively psychoanalytic, unpleasant, confrontational, and what I was interested in were hallucinations. So when I got to psilocybin, I remember after my first mushroom trip, I said, thank God we found this stuff. I'll never take LSD again. That wasn't quite true, but I'll bet I've taken it less than half a dozen times since my first psilocybin trip. So, uh, and, and in terms of the chemistry of these things, my conclusion from all this fiddling is that it's the indole hallucinogens that are at the center of the mandala. They do what we want them to do with very little detrimental side effects. LSD is one of them. Uh, Ibogaine is one of them, not one widely known. We gotta save something for our old age, folks. Uh, <laughs> harmine and harmaline, the beta carbolines. A when complexed with DMT, and then psilocybin, and I think that's the basic list. Well, those do, they, these are really the keys which open the lock very easily, very cleanly, very uh, dependably, and that's where I would put all of my attention. And, you know, even in that domain, you have to be somewhat... Uh, careful. My brother and I spent years tracking down a hallucinogen in the Amazon called Ukuhe that uh, was an orally active form of DMT, which we remember I said that DMT is destroyed in the gut. So we were fascinated to try and find this Ukuhe because we wanted to know how it was possible that it could work orally. And also, the ethnographic accounts claimed that uh, the people who used it spoke with little men. And we wanted to see these little men, to see if they were the same little men we were trying to. Well, we had three expeditions to the Amazon before we finally closed in on this stuff. And when we finally got it, you know, with this tremendous sense of having attained the grail and having finally this was going to do it, this was going to be the one, to then we took this stuff 
And my God, it turned us every way but loose. Your heart feels like it's pounding its way out of the front of your chest. You vomit. Uh, you have tremoring of the limbs. On and on and on. So we go through this, live through it, wash off in the river and go looking for the shaman to lodge a complaint. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, yeah, well, it's hard to get used to. And uh, so then when we get it back home to the lab and do the high pressure gas chromatography and all the rest of it and see what's really there, you see that the genetic component of the varola trees from which this resin is extracted is it's a mess. It's too many tryptamines. DMT, DET, 5-monomethyl tryptamine, 5-MAO DMT, and several other cardioactive tryptamines. It looked like they'd swept the floor of an indole chemist's lab to put together the components of this plant. You don't want this. You know, because you, it's like taking ten drugs at once. You know, it's all running together. You can't tell whether you're Agnes or Angus. What you want is uh, a, a DMT source where when you put it in the grass, in the uh, grass chromatograph, no, in the uh, gas chromatograph, <laughs> you get one spike. That's N-N-dimethyltryptamine, and all the rest is cellulose, a little DNA, and that's all, some minerals and salt. Uh, if, if you don't have a clean source, then, you know, it's contaminated. So even that legendary shamanic hallucinogen, uh, when actually put to the, to the uh, use test, wasn't able to, to pass it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, going back to the DMT and uh, mushroom psilocybin, um, you were talking about uh, taking psilocybin and then doing breath control is indistinguishable from a DMT trip. If you do it correctly, you can coax it. Um, since this is a learning tree and you're sort of in front there, maybe you could give us an idea of what it's like to coax five grand into it. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you won't be able to give us all the information, but maybe you can sort of enlighten us a little bit and we can sort of work in that direction. At least I can work in that direction. Well, you mean how do you get at the peak of a psilocybin trip to deliver you into DMT land? Yes, because sometimes I get a little jealous hearing you talk about DMT trip. <laughs> and I sit here and say, uh, you know, I want to find that stuff. And you know, Anyway, so... Well, the thing is... Uh, psilocybin will take you there if you have the courage and the stamina to tolerate the duration of, of the psilocybin revelation. Thank so you. first of all, you take a heroic dose, five, six, seven grams. Then when you're peaking, uh, well, you smoke cannabis. Then... You, you sit in silent darkness alone because I think the presence of other people always pins you to the surface right. with this stuff. I mean, you don't need somebody else. There. No matter if they're talking or not, they can just be in no, the room just, and you're aware of just that. Just sitting and, there, yeah. then this is a different thing. Yeah. Uh, breathing, exhaling, breathing, exhaling, and then you form an intention for it to approach you. I mean, you say, I can feel it. I mean, it's almost a, it's a neighborhood. It's a pharmacological neighborhood. And, and you know how you may go to Little Italy, but there are no Italians on the street. But if you start, uh, you know, you have to somehow shake them out of the nest. And it, you simply ask for them to appear. I always hark back to that episode of I Love Lucy where she and Ethel are discussing how to contact the space people and Lucy tells Ethel, she says, well, I just say, come in, little green men, come in, little green men. And yeah, yeah, it's a big laugh now, but try it on 25 milligrams of 
maternity ward. But these toys, if that's what they are, are essentially teaching machines of some sort. They're trying to get you to perform this linguistic activity. As far as the UFO thing is concerned, I think it's... Uh, It sort of requires some background. Uh, I think that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with our understanding of the world. Fundamentally wrong. And what it is, is that we believe that the past creates the present. That the present is the is the sum total of actions and situations that exist in the past. In other words, we believe that the horse pushes the cart. The horse doesn't push the cart. The cart is pulled. There is an attractor in the future. There is actually, uh, I think of history as a bowl down the slope we are making our way well since we are uh, in a in a situation where conservation of energy is important where are we all going to end up the bottom of the bowl obviously that if you release a marble up on the rim it's going to make its way down the bowl to the what's called the dwell point the place where uh, the energy requirements are such that the forward momentum of, of the falling ball is satisfied by meeting the resistance of the bottom of the bowl. History is like this. We are being pulled forward by an attractor. It has somehow come into the human world and has pulled us out of animal organization. If this attractor were not present, we would still probably be cheerfully slinging excrement around in the canopy of some jungle tree. But because of the attractor, we have been pulled into social organization, technology, language, community, so forth and so on. And um, mystics and seers and visionaries are people who have a relationship to this attractor that is different from the rest of us. They can uh, glimpse aspects of this thing. And when I think of it this way, I, I always think of those jewel, the the mirrored ball that they hang over the bar in a disco, and then they spin it and it throws reflections of light all over the room from the ambient lighting. Well, history is like this. Uh, the attractor at the end of time, which is below the event horizon of the present and thus impossible to anticipate its true form, uh, sends back through time distorted reflections of itself, which, if you are struck by one of these distorted reflections, well, then you begin to preach and cure 
and local conditions may damp your activity, and then you're what's called a nut. But if, in fact, local conditions support your activity so that you become a mean spreader, then you're suddenly a messiah, a teacher, a Buddha, a Christ, a Mohammed. That's what these people were. They were people who were, for reasons mysterious to themselves, I'm sure, in a relationship of resonance with the transcendental object, such that they, in a sense, embodied it. Well, um, in our own era, because of technology, and Jung was on to this when he wrote his book in 1948 called Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. He said, the flying saucer is an image of the self that is, uh, haunts the skies of Earth as a compensatory effect to our alienation. Well, I think that that's exactly what's going on, except that he didn't realize how nuts and bolts that explanation was. The UFO is a mirage being cast backward into time by the transcendental object at the end of time. And that's why it has such a hair-raising aura of weirdness about it. It isn't a ship from another star system. I mean, how could anyone reasonably entertain that idea, given the distances in time and what you find when you get here? I mean, who would make that trip who had any reasonable uh, way to spend their time? It's, uh, it's a uh, compensatory image that haunts time because time is a kind of hologram. Time is a fractal. And fractal means that the same pattern is embedded again and again in a relationship of self-similarity. So because the transcendental object exists somewhere ahead of us in history, there must necessarily be a tiny part of it somewhere nearby. And this, this is what the UFO is, I think. And this is why you, nobody's ever going to show you a chunk of it, and they're never going to uh, put an extraterrestrial on network television, because it isn't that kind of a creature. It's, uh, it's a compensatory image from the end of time. This leads me to uh, an aspect of what I wanted to talk about, or what I very briefly and obliquely indicated this morning, which was when I was talking about um, uh, how we're halfway through history, but the rest of it has to happen in only 30 years. I think that we're moving towards something called concrescence. This isn't my word, it's Alfred North Whitehead's word. I think you can tell what it means. It means everything melts together into one thing. I think that from the very birth of the universe, this is bigger than the human species, bigger than the life of the Earth. From the very first moments of the universe's existence, it has been itself under the domain, under the influence of an attractor. And this attractor is pulling everything into tighter and tighter states of self-reflective resonance. And that now we are very close to this concrescent uh, event. And that in fact human history, I called it the shock wave of eschatology. But I didn't talk much about what eschatology is as because well, first of all, it lies below the event horizon of the present historical epoch. But it won't always. It could rise above the horizon at any time. You know, 2000, 1996, you name it. But we have been too long under the spell of the idea that only the past 
creates the present. The present is actually largely created by appetite for the future. And um, this would seem to me a highly improbable idea had I not taken psychedelics and gotten this hyperdimensional view of the system that we're living in. And then you can see that, yes, history is not a random walk. It's not a series of undirected random fluctuations. History is a process of fractal self-complexification that builds on whatever it has achieved. And so upon the complexity of animal organization is laying the complexity of human language. Upon the complexity of human language is laid the complexity of symbolic signification of that language, i.e. writing. Upon writing is laid electronic technology, and so forth and so on. So we are, in a sense, in the act of giving birth to or creating the object of our theologies, which is a kind of god or goddess, depending on you know, how you slice into it, how you feel about it. And the, the UFO is simply an indicator that we are so close now to encountering the, the concrescent transcendental object that it's able to haunt the skies of Earth and the imaginations of people who live in trailer parks. Uh, it, this is, uh, you know, you have to remember that history itself is a, is a violation of the laws of nature and history and its consequences are all around us. We don't have to argue about whether is history happening. I mean, if obviously it's happening, we're embedded late in it. But it's caused by the fact that ordinary nature, the nature of glaciers, chipmunks, anthills, termites, termite nests, and whale pods, has come, at least in the case of our species, under the influence of something which is literally fastened onto us and is now recreating us in its image. You know, it's taking a monkey body and it's saying, you know, stand it up, slide the eyes around to the front, oppose the thumb, shed the hair, enlarge the brain, put ideas into the brain, so forth and so on. I mean, we are being recast as something unimaginable to the rest of nature. And we are now fairly close to uh, figuring out what this is. This is why we are able to talk about human-machine symbiosis, virtual reality, downloading ourselves to the size of viruses in a nanotechnological domain, stuff like that. Did you say that the index of compressors to look at this current version of flat is taking you said to contact team and presentation what's his name at Harvard but who's actually been hooked and all the number of people who worked with who claim to have had fertilization. Yeah, I would, I'm more, I agree with your idea that it's an index of the depth of concrescence, though muddied by shrewd public relations types who are making a living off this stuff. I think the crop circles are more, a more honest indication of how close we are to the transcendental body. Uh, I interviewed the person you mentioned at Harvard for a film we did in Prague a few months ago, and I, uh, his name was, I'm a boy, uh, and I had to ask him halfway through the interview, I said, well, do you detect anything in your own psychological makeup which makes you unfit to be doing this work? 
that was after he told me that he'd interviewed 500 women who had had fetuses removed from their bodies by space people. <laughs> and he said, you know, the amazing thing about this is there are no physical scars at all. <laughs> and I said, well, what does this suggest to you? And he said, advanced surgical techniques of which we have no knowledge. And I'm just, uh, my craft detector went, a wall on that answer. Um, <coughs> the rules of evidence are not in suspension for the new age. And, uh, you know, people who recall their lifetime as the barber of Nefertiti or whatever uh, have s serious. Uh, problem with what I call the rules of evidence. Uh, they don't seem to have ever heard of Occam's Razor, which you study logic for 10 minutes, and they tell you about Occam's Razor. Do you all know what this is? It's a simple idea. Keep it next to you. Uh, hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. And there are a lot of unnecessary hypotheses running around, uh, especially in the New Age domain. Uh, I, I would study the impregnation effect more as an example of mass hysteria, because, you know, being in the position that I am in, supposedly a revered teacher and a person of great uh, insight and all this hoopla and crapola, you occasionally get invited to dinner with the movers and shakers, and then you hear what's said when not on stage. And I have to tell you, there's enough cynicism to uh, satisfy a Renaissance pope among these people. Uh, they, they are...